For you, it's a new point of view to chew over what's new to you. Shoot the breeze, make buddies, and Melissa MCs, families, memories, original artists. Hello and welcome to the Original Artist Series. Thank you so much for tuning in again. Um, we are on week four. Can you believe it? I started with doing a couple fundraisers for Stonewall and they both were really successful. And Leonie and I were like, you know, we really enjoy talking to people. My favorite part of those fundraisers were not only, of course, raising some money for Stonewall, but also having, you know, kind of a deeper dive talk with some of my friends that are artists. And so basically our mission is to bring to you every week an artist that you may or may not know, um, may or may not have been in any major productions or major publications, and some have, of course, but either way, an opportunity to have a deeper, much deeper conversation as opposed to just the surface talk we get and also maybe you see someone in a performance, but you've never spoken to them before and they might grace our stage. So today we have a very special late afternoon episode for you today. Today we're bringing in two guests all the way from Durban, South Africa. So our very first guest is Leonie's brother-in-law. His name is Stefan Hofmeier, and he is going to tell you a little bit about all this wonderful art that surrounds me every week. So without further ado, please welcome Stefan. Hi, Stefan. Hello. How are you doing? I'm very well, and you? How's it going in Durban? Oh, lovely, actually. The ban has been lifted on That's alcohol. That's amazing. Yeah, in effect from, I think, Monday night, 12 o'clock. So Tuesday, okay. people. So it's not about just the alcohol, it's about the whole industry starting up again, the restaurants oh, can open. And, yeah. So, so how, we're very excited. Is, I'm excited for you too. How has quarantine been for you in South Africa? Um, I think it was difficult for most South Africans. For me as an artist, always sort of being in isolation, it was not much different. Uh, Marshan being at home was actually quite nice. Um, but uh, we all just uh, mostly worried about the economy. That's that our main concern at this stage. Uh, our numbers in the in our infection rate is going down. So that's that's a good thing at least. That's good. So now just to get that's everything good. back up and going again will be yeah. Yeah. Will be something to look forward to. I hear you. We feel very much the same way. Definitely a lot of compassion and a. A lot of gratitude for you know being able to have some time together but also always keeping in mind the people that are that have gotten sick and a lot of the people who are still not working and struggling so so where our sentiments yeah. are the same. so i wanted to you know first of all thank you for i know leonie has had the intention to sell most of your art that she and i know she sold some but i feel really fortunate to have your work surrounding us every day. It's so beautiful. But I wanted to, you know, for our friends and family and uh, loved ones that are watching and also some people that might not know you, I wanted to just kind of ask you some questions and uh, get to know you. I know you, but I want the world to know you a little bit better. Um, oh, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> of Thanks course. for inviting me. Of course. So I want to know just a little bit about where you grew up. In South Africa? Well, yeah, ironically, I grew up in Durban, yeah, where we are. Uh, we moved back here about eight years ago, um, when, just when I turned four. So this is where I basically grew up, and a little bit in Makumalanga as well. Back then it was the Eastern Transvaal. Um, so, yeah, I matriculated there in Nelspre, and then I went on to study in Pretoria. So, yeah, basically all over. And uh, yeah, but we returned. Well, I returned to to Durban, bringing my shunt home with me, basically. Okay. So. 
Yeah. Now, in terms of your schooling and drawing, I know like in the United States, um, art is part of the curriculum. At least it was when I was growing up as when I was young. Was art part of your curriculum or is this something that you found out that you were talented or, or before we get to that, is this something you did on your own? It was something I did on my own. Even before school, I used to draw and build little structures and always keeping myself busy. I was actually, I'm the youngest of, of five brothers. I've got four okay. older brothers. They all look quite a bit older than me and they like real art, doorsy kind of people so i had to keep myself busy and, you know keep my own company basically so but that was not the only reason i really loved arts i just both my parents were very artistic so i suppose i always watched them and you know thought that's something i can get into yeah and what was the first drawing that you remember either maybe giving to you know a loved one or maybe putting up on your fridge or something that you felt really proud of that you shared when you were younger? Uh, well, there were many, you know, before school, but, but something I do remember is a painting of, or actually just a drawing, I didn't really paint back then, um, of Heidi. I don't know if you remember the TV series, Heidi and Peter. Yeah, I'm talking about it, yeah. Yeah, living in the Swiss Alps. So when TV just came out in South Africa, they had it translated into Afrikaans. So it was, it was actually quite a big hit. I'm talking in the 1970s, yeah. So I drew uh, Heidi, and I think I was in uh, grade one, which is we had, um, grade one was like your third year of school. And I drew that, and I actually sold it for 50 cents. So. I was eight years old when I did my first deal. That's <laughs> so, amazing. Yeah, that's kind of, yeah I, I remember that. that part. Yeah. Oh, that's so great. No, yeah, and it was a portrait, and I still, I'm still doing portraits. So, yeah. So, you sold it for fifty cents, and then when was your first time that you it kind of landed with you that you were talented, that you actually this isn't something for fun, this isn't something that is maybe you do sometimes, that you actually knew you were talented and knew that you had an eye and a talent for art? I think when we moved to Mapumalanga, and I, that was sort of an isolated situation. We lived on a rural farm and we really struggled to get uh, television, even radio reception. So that was basically all I could do. Is that, that was my first time. Then my brothers already left home and it was just me and my parents so um yeah i that was my when i came back from school i did art in between a little bit of homework and even then i started selling some some of the pieces but i knew that there was no other way for me than to go study art that was the only thing i wanted to do and i applied to different colleges i got in at all of them and then but I proceeded to go study at Pretoria Technicon. And okay. yeah, that's I, I sort of, yeah, that was basically a turning, not a turning point, but it all came together, you know, so. Well, yeah. I think when you're accepted into school as an artist, whether I was a singer and accepted into all my schools and I chose the one I did because of the demographic and also I got a little scholarship. But when you're, that kind of is kind of a validation when you do get accepted and get some sort of marker in your life that, okay, not saying that artists that don't get in shouldn't still pursue, I don't mean that, but um, it does provide a little bit of validation when you do get into school. I think Absolutely, that- Absolutely, yeah. Confidence. It, I'm, it, it sure does you, confidence. I'm sure you had to sub submit some music and- so Oh yeah. Forth. And with us, we had to submit a portfolio and obviously it was good enough for them to, to you know, accept me. So that's yeah. Yeah, that yeah. Was definitely, because you had no one to really measure yourself to, you know, so being accepted at a big national college or institution was 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 quite something and you sort of knew then you on the right track. So tell us with the right track, tell us a couple of highlights from your from your time in school. Well, in school, um I well I Specifically, look, our first year was a basic year, so we did 
anything from sculpting to graphic design and so forth. But I always sort of were drawn more towards drawing and then painting as well. Um, a little bit of photography here and there. Um, but we had a yearly exhibition where we had people from outside to come and evaluate our work. And I, you know, got some good reviews. So that's the highlights. And then, you know, I studied while in a very political time in our South African history. And I was right in the center of town in Pretoria. So there was a lot of stuff happening around that time and in that area. So that's something I really remember very well. And I'm sure that also sort of sparked some creative juice, I suppose. Um, yeah, uh, strangely enough, after I studied, I didn't go into painting directly. I first uh, did decor and props and so forth for theater and television and that, that kind of thing, actually for almost 10, 15 years. Wow. And then I only started painting because it's, uh, I mean, it, you know, it's a, it's a difficult um, career choice. Is just Absolutely. To produce art and not knowing whether it's going to sell or not. Right. Yeah. So I did a lot of commercial work and theming and those kind of things. No, but that's that a great experience. It is great experience because I was still out there earning my living with a brush in hand, you know. So. And learning, right. I feel like we're always learning. Yeah, ex exactly. That's, well, that's the purpose of life. And If we want to get all philosophical. Exactly. Well. <laughs> I want to, you know, talk about some of the paintings you have here. But I, I will say, you know, in some industries, um, as you get older, it doesn't, necessarily really matter. I mean, I, I think there's ageism in all art careers. I mean, I think it depends on whether you're a dancer or a singer or an actor, but I really think if you're an actor, singer, or even a painter, there's something about getting older and being wiser that I feel, and this isn't just me saying that because I, you know, <laughs> I'm getting older. We all, we're all getting older, but I feel like there's some sort of wisdom and, and that's something. Oh, absolutely. I want to hear you talk about a little bit about, you know, your paint. We're going to show some of your work, but a little bit about, you know, as the years have progressed, kind of how your art has gotten deeper and wiser. Yeah, in 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 many ways, not only the theme, but also the way I paint. You know, when you're a young artist, you ultimately try to do photorealism. You know, and then as you get older, you realize it's more important. To make your own mark, to, to create something that's true to you, and that just is happening every day. The older I get, the more I get into finding my own little place and, and style that I've created. You know, obviously some some outside influences, and um, but it's still me. You know, I, I get phone calls from from different countries and even here in South Africa said, well, I just walked past the painting of yours and I didn't even have to look at the, the signature. I knew immediately it was yours. And that's that's a huge compliment, you know, so people can sort of identify my work without seeing the signature. And that's that's, that's great. And I do love your signature. I was looking at it last night. I, I do love your <laughs> signature. Yeah. Oh, let's yeah people ask me why I don't <laughs> put my surname down. Um, but there was an artist, uh, American artist, who used to, strangely enough, he was also, well, not strangely, it's actually a very direct link. His name was also Stefan. He worked with, um, what was the guy, Tom of Finland. He did um, uh, little drawings and animations, and he just signed St Stefan, but it was PH. And I think it was because it was a bit risque, some of the drawings. So I think it was sort of to protect him in a way. For me, I just thought it's nice, you know, and it, it has a nice feel to it. So I put my surname at the back or whatever. And people know what my surname is. So, yeah. Right. So I want to start. So we're going to go over three paintings and four I just want to show. A couple I just want to show. But let's start with our, our Nelson Mandela. So I'm going to minimize let's see if i can do this you and 
full bottles. Um, <laughs> tell us about, so this is Stefan's um, signature he's talking about. Tell us a little bit about who commissioned you, if anyone, how this came about, who this is, and where they are. Tell us everything. I think I painted that when he turned, I'm not sure now, but it was it was a milestone for him. It was on his run about his birthday, but he already passed away by then. And then I did some some research and I found that he actually went to New York City and this little show went to New York City. And um, I saw that he went there directly after he was released from prison. Not directly, I think it was um, he went in nine. I'm not sure now. 90, yeah, in 92, I think he went to New York and he was very well received there. There was like 750,000 people welcoming him. So you can just imagine um, what a huge experience that must have been. Um, and then you, you can see the Twin Towers in the back, which was a big and very sad and traumatic event for. for for the, the people of the U.S. and um, you know, I thought just combining the two, you know, that because when he visited, they were still there, you know. So, you know, that's what that painting is about. And then okay. the style is basically one of my favorite styles. It's almost where drawing meets painting, you know, and you have some running paints and some natural things happening there in the hair and so forth. Well, we love it. This this one, I don't, I don't remember really any, I don't know. We're, we're keeping this one. We love it. So let's move on. <laughs> if I didn't tell you that already. Let's move on to this one. <laughs> well, her name is Vuyi, and she's sort of named after a friend of mine. It's not a painting of hers. She was just named after, after her because she's She's such an outrageous young person and um, is it outrageous to write? Courageous. She's a courageous person. You know. And um, that specific one, the skin is very dark. And one of the things that I like about painting African people, although in African culture, it's not always seen as a good thing to have a dark skin. But as European, I find it beautiful because all the different colors that reflect from that you know so you get blues and all kinds of you know where you don't always find that look at our faces you know we it's just light and shadow you know? so that was mainly the inspiration i used a lot of uh gold dust there in the background mixed with the paint um you can't always see that you have to look up close but unfortunately you can't see that now no, it's beautiful and she's she's got a very sort of typical um, African bone structure, you can see by the chin and so forth. Very pronounced cheekbones, yeah. So yeah, that's it about that one. All right. So this one is gorgeous. Let's move on to, let's do a couple more. Okay, let's go. Are we doing this one, Leonie? Yes. Thank you, Bernard. Okay, let's go to this one. I know you like that one. You know I like I know. this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's not a specific person. What I do is part of my process is to put different faces together, you know. Um, yeah, you've told me that to before. Create, yeah, to create like the ultimate African queen, almost a mother of, of mankind like they say you know the mitochondrial um eve if you like um and then of course the very well african women are known for their head scarves and head wraps and and so forth and so almost part of 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 the culture well it is part of the culture i think this is where it originated from well here in the middle east but we've got a our African women has a very specific way of wrapping it. And it's almost it's almost like a crown, you know, it has that sort of shape. So yeah, I'm 
completely in love with the different ways they, they make it up and, and the material they use. That's a very sort of grayish color. I just wanted to show the, the basic shape, but sometimes it can be very bright and colorful. And I think I like this one too, because um, you know I love this one. I really feel like you bring out the emotion in people's eyes. That you oh, well, that. create like a story that goes with maybe what you think they're feeling or I think it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I, African women are very strong, especially South African African women. Um, I'm. I'm in no place to to have an opinion. I don't know the the African women in other countries so well, but what I know of the people I have contact with, they are very resilient and very strong. And they are more than often they are the breadwinners of their families, you know, and they uh, bring up their children without fathers, and, and they they just they actually quite quite special special people yeah. so yeah there's a it's not it's not sadness that you see it's almost you know a serenity if you like you know and strong yeah. this resilience it's so beautiful so i'm gonna put this Thank one you so much. and then we're gonna move to now this is one of leone's favorites can you tell us about your afternoon here that you guys spent together? Oh, yes, that was lovely. Um, that's the Umslanga, um a Lighthouse. And the angle, where, I think it was actually a picture we took, if I'm not mistaken. And that's from the Oyster Box. The Oyster Box is a stunning old colonial hotel. Um, when you come and visit, eventually we'll take you there. Um, so that's the view from from the oyster box, and uh, yeah, it's just such a typical lighthouse, you know, the very simple white with the red at the at the top, and it's a beautiful beach. I mean, you can even see the little umbrellas; they are all, you know, color coded, you know, red and white. That's the theme. So yeah, I can't remember exactly when they built that lighthouse, but I know it's been there since I since I can remember, which is in the 70s. I think it's one of the first memories that Leone, when I first met Leone six, seven years ago, um, she told me about that she showed me a picture and uh, told me just a, a wonderful day you all had. And then when she moved in, this came with, and I said, yay, now we have the memory in our house, yeah. which is so yeah, great. I, we really need to take you there as soon as you come to visit in Durban. Yes, okay, so we have one more that Leonie wants me to show. Okay. So I remember um, Leonie and I got together in 2013 and we decided to get married, I think the end of 2014. And she had sent you a couple pictures. One was of a bridge and one was of us. And you hadn't met me yet because we met Christmas of 2015, I believe. That's right, yes. So, um, so anyway. Strangely enough, I was just telling a friend about that today when we arrived there, and it was so lovely meeting you. So much fun. Yeah, we, yeah. Well, as soon as we're allowed, we're, I'm coming there, you're coming here. But you drew this of us. Oh, yes. We hadn't even met us yet. And I, I have, we have the picture on our, our bed stand. But, you know, you got you got it right, and it's so gorgeous, and it hangs on our wall. Of course, we feel a little narcissistic, but I don't care. I, I no, like please. <laughs> but I loved it so so very much, and I when I finally met you, it was just so wonderful. Because I remember the unveiling at our other apartment across the street where where we lived before, and you you know unboxed it, unveiled it, and I was so excited. And I just could not believe um, just how accurate it was, the nose, the eyebrows. It's just incredible. No, there were many pictures to, to, to choose from, but that one was just so intimate, you know, sort of yeah. described everything that I knew about you guys. 
what she Thank told you. us and you know, the whole process, the whole story, everything that happened. So I thought that was the, the ideal one. There's another one of the both of you with a New York map at the back. I don't know if you remember that. It's also gorgeous, but it had a lot of light filtering screens. I could see all the things. I think Betty Bangles needs a photo. A I, mean, I a think so, yes. Oh, yes, definitely. Send Stefan a, fo a photo of you. He'll do it from the photo. I know you guys met at the Beefcakes, but. I actually I introduced the two of you. Do you know that? I went up to him or her then. I went up to yeah. Betty and I said, we've got friends here from New York and she's the entertainment director, you know. So, and then you just took over, <laughs> like you do. And yes, you I do. Thanks, Betty. <laughs> yeah, we had Betty perform in New York, so we're, we definitely. I saw did. that. Yeah, I watched it. I, I, I watched it all, you know, so uh, we were very envious, but yeah, Which is I'm small. happy. Oh, yeah. yeah, Betty, this is it. So all you got to do is send Stefan a picture of you. And this is his email that you see in the ticker. I'll keep that going throughout uh, for a little while, and then we'll put it back up at the end. And then that is um, his Instagram. And then we added also his um, website that Liani is just about finished with. So, yeah, maybe, that, maybe something of Betty in the stone wall, or I'll actually oh, go yeah. through that. Yeah. yeah, I think you, did, you like, know my connection with the stone wall as well. I'm like. Oh, that's right. Leonie, can you grab the stone wall picture, please, real quick? So another thing, um, Stefan, so for the 50th anniversary um, that just happened last year, and unfortunately, we didn't have, like, a proper pride this year because, um, you know, oh, yeah. So not well, that one. You... Well, maybe, maybe. Leonie, Leonie, stone wall picture. That's my tech crew, everybody. So this was the picture that Stefan drew. Oh, yes. Sorry, painted. So that's just showing you that that's how much we love that picture. Okay, so really quick. Stefan did this for us. I'm going to explain what happened. So we had the 50th anniversary was last year. But before that, we wanted to give a gift to the owner of Stonewall, Kurt Kelly, also goes by Curtis Kelly. And we were like, Leonie and I were sitting here, we're like, what can we possibly do? And he's not like an egomaniac, so he wouldn't necessarily want a picture of himself or you know, any, his dog or something like that. So we're like, let's ask Stefan to paint the Stonewall. So then Stefan came up with the idea after doing a little research of doing the old stone wall and the present stone wall because it's changed a little bit in its um, structure, not, not the actual structure, but the way the, the front is um, front facing the street and just, uh, you know, with time. And anyway, so this is an actual oil that Leone had done as a print. So I'll just show you. And you so this is the old stone wall. So again, this is a print of an oil is it oil am i saying it correct correct is it yeah, yeah 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 oil well it's a mix i i mix the two so you mix it and then this is the new or current and then this and is i think that was just after president obama also declared it as a monument didn't he more yeah, or less so around that time national monument yeah it was around that time yeah so i think we gave it to him in 2000 16 or 17, you you had mailed it to us, or maybe Ina brought it. How did I get it there? With Ina, with our mother-in-law? Either Ina, our, our mother-in-law, that's right. Mm. Um, <laughs> mailed it, I don't remember. Either way, this is the amazing work of stuff. It's a nice print. It's a beautiful print. Yeah, Leone, Leone got it printed. We, we had the intention of um, and maybe we still can, you know, sell some, but for this one, it stays on my wall and just reminds me again of yeah. your work. I love it. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Vanna White. <laughs> Leonie, your tech crew. So before I show the video that Leonie made of your work, which is absolutely incredible, 
Tell us again, I know I just mentioned it, how if someone's watching and they want a painting, what's their first step? Um, actually, the only will know better, but there I see at the bottom of the screen, there's many different ways to contact me. So contact, <laughs> you, so contact you with perhaps what they have in mind. This is also a great yeah. gift. Great what to have in mind, you know, whether it's a place or a memory or, you know, a group photo or whatever the case may be, you know, and then they can decide whether they want it just like that, just painted, uh, or they can decide for me to put a, a personal touch to it, you know, do it a bit more in a, in a my specific brush stroke or, you know, yeah. We, we usually yeah. there's uh, emails going back and forth and um yeah we'll fi we'll figure a way out to get it to wherever it needs to go especially now okay. i'm careering again again yeah right I'm leaning fedex or something like that or dhl <laughs> yeah so, <laughs> so at this time leone put together a montage of uh, many photos you have of your work and then the song that she found is um, a song that John Bronston my pianist had arranged for me for a show I did about 12 years ago I think and I um, on the recording it's Robbie Stamper playing it so please enjoy really? Yeah, Robbie played it, and then John put together the arrangement. Wow, so I, I, I know the whole team you know the whole team. I, got to, uh, yeah, I know the whole team. You know, and th that is such a flippin' gorgeous song. Um, I was we had a hike to the whaling station today, so only when I came back, my son showed it to me because we didn't have reception, and I couldn't believe it. It was just so perfect. And um, the beginning of the video has a few paintings of the LGTBI exhibition we did, which is actually oh, quite special. Hearing your voice and seeing the images it was you know, quite well that's quite so good and as soon as we, after i show the video we're going to come back and we're going to talk about that too yeah definitely right. this is a montage and every work that you see in the montage is by stefan okay i'll see you in about three minutes okay great Try to think that love's not around The facts uncomfortably clear My old heart ain't gaining no ground Because my angel eyes ain't here Angel lies that old devil sent They glow unbearably bright Need I say that my love my angel eyes tonight so drink up all you people order anything you see have fun you happy people the drink and the laugh are on me Pardon me But I've got to run The facts uncomfortably clean Gotta find Who's now number one Angel eyes ain't
That's so beautiful. Thank you, guys. Leone, well done. Wow. Putting that Thank together. You, Leone. And that song is amazing. I know. You know, I, know. I love that. I went to work last night, and all of a sudden, she's got all the videos. Amazing. Yeah, she's brilliant. Thank you so much. So really quick, before we get to our next question I have for you, tell us about what is behind you. Oh, that was actually someone sort of commissioned, and I just went along. So she hasn't even seen it yet. It's just wings. She wanted it as a as a headboard, basically. So that's something oh, I'm busy yeah. working on at the moment. Someone, it's got some uh, lovely gold eat in, and obviously you can take a photo like this. Then you know something like. <laughs> Let me take a picture. Come. <laughs> Let me take a picture before we. That's so cool. So this is, oh, this is from Amber. She left us a comment. Oh, thank you, Amber. Thanks, Amber. Okay, so let's do a quick photo before we bring uh, Stefan or Marshawn Dion. Okay, ready? Okay, well, that's it. <laughs> Leonie's okay. Then we have a comment from Leonie. Oh, this is what she said. Miss Leonie, which is true. Oh, thank you. Thank it's you so much. So I think that our next portion of the show, we have a very, very special kind sir that's sitting next to you. I think that we should call him Doctor. Doctor Doctor. doctor. <laughs> Am I saying that correctly? Wonderscape? Yeah, Fonderscape. Fonderscape. Hi Mel. Hi, honey. I've been trying to pronounce your name all day. <laughs> I don't think I've ever said his name out loud. What my surname? Oh. <laughs> uh, you, you know what? Yeah, I just I just go by Mashant, I'm like sure, like Madonna, and just Mashant. <laughs> so Marshant, I feel like congratulations are in order. Tell us about what you just accomplished. Um, <laughs> thanks, Mel. Uh, well, you know what? It's it's not it's not Doctor yet. It's um it's out there. It's in the pipeline. Um, COVID nineteen put so many things kind of on the back burner. Um, so PhD thesis was handed in, um, feedback corrections was done, editors did their thing, it's now just in the mill. So um, officially I don't, I, I, I'm not a PhD yet um, because it's somewhere still in the administrative ether, but yeah, thank you so much. Done and dusted, it was like giving birth to a very big baby um, that I was in labor for for about three years. So yeah, it's uh, it's, uh, it's done and dusted. So uh, very happy. Well, before we get to the result, tell us, let's go all the way back to the beginning. And then I want to connect, you know, you and Stefan and how you met. But before we get there, 
tell us what you studied in undergrad and how you got there, how you decided, at what point you decided what your passion was and tell everyone what exactly that is, because I know it's very specific. Yeah. Um, well, when, when I started studying, it was really just because I, you know, I had an aptitude for people. So I knew that I wanted to be working with people. I unfortunately didn't have like a beautiful voice like you or, you know, drawing talents like Steer Fun or musical talents like, like even Leone. Um, but I did, I did have um, a passion for, for working with people. And um, I, for the longest time, wanted to be a psychologist um, up until, you know, I, I realized that it was less about working with, with people and it was more about, um, you know, brain chemistry and those different kinds of things. And it's not really what I wanted to do. I wanted to work with people. So I, I started studying um, international communications and then I thought, well, it combines the best of both worlds. You know, it's communication where I work with people and then I'm going to be traveling the world as a diplomat. Um, and then I started realizing what it was really about. And it was about delving into the how people relate to one another, um, how they present themselves, how they build relationships, you know, those kind of things. And that is really what, what got me into the, the field of communications. And it's so it's so broad and diverse. It's really something that you can sink your teeth in. Um, a, a very good friend of mine um, that I work with, uh, Dr. Natalie Emsley, she, for example, went into uh, environmental studies. You know, so she's very passionate about veganism and environmental studies. And for me, as a as a LGBTIQ um, member, I, I thought about how communication is a really important part of our, our sexual identity, sexual representation, and those kinds of things. Um, and I was very fortunate. I think my mom did something right because my sister is also part of the LGBTI community. So she, she fed us the right stuff. I don't know if it was something in the water or something she, I, I don't know, but- She's um, a good mom, that's for sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, feminism and, and, and being surrounded by, by all these very strong, independent women, my mom being one, um, aunt, uh, my sisters, um, you know, all these incredible women that I have in my life, friends, um, it, it, it really, got to me that um, we live in a society that is really patriarchal. Um, it, it suppresses a lot of their talents. Um, they don't have access in, in the same way or with the same ease um, as, as men do. Um, and and as, a, as a queer individual, you know, I, I identify that struggle even though it's not the same thing. And we had a conversation one day in one of my journalism classes, and I was having a conversation with one of um, one of my students. She's now one of uh, a very good friend of mine, um, a journalism student, and we were talking about um, gender-based violence, you know, and how it's so ubiquitous in our society. We sort of, you know, we we have these cute kind of campaigns that we have. Um, to address it, but it doesn't really change anything much about it. Generation by generation, you know, we, we, we promote that men should be respectful to women, but we don't really live that kind of reality. We, 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 don't, um, we don't practice what we preach. And while I was having this conversation with a student of mine, um, she said, but you know what, Mishant, in my community where I live, it's just par for the course. You know, if you get sexually abused, if you get um, uh, raped, you know, it's it's not something that people even uh, go to the police about. You know, they, they don't talk about it. It's very often the family, um, you know, deal with it amongst them, among themselves. But for them, it's almost shameful 
um, if you were a victim of a violent crime. And as we were talking about it, um, and I said to her, you know, because there are different kinds of sexual um, abuse and violence that women go through, and we started talking about the different kinds, and, and I started talking about corrective rape, you know, um, which is where, where men uh, very often by, by the family, they're commandeered by the family. Um, you know, if, if a girl in the family acts a little bit mannish, you know, in their way, in the way that she walks, maybe she's a little bit too independent, um, you know, then they try and correct uh, the, the, the deviant behavior through sexual violence. Um, and nobody knew what I was talking about. Like it happens, um, but people just don't give it any salience. And that's when I, I thought, you know, I, I've got to talk about it. I've, I've got to study about it. I have to, in my small little contributory way, I've got to do something about it. And that's, that's when this whole journey started. Which is yeah. really important, and I think it's incredible the work that you do. Can you tell us a little bit about some of your thesis papers you've written? And I know you were published. Can you give us a little more info, um, insight into that? Yeah. Um, when when I did my master's studies, it was specifically on on curative and corrective rape. Um, yeah. And and one of the things that I that I thought about was you know, of all these very beautiful, strong, independent women that I that I know and that I love, um, friends and family, if, if, if they had to go through this sexual violence, um, how would the media deal with it? So, you know, because my, my area of, of speciality is communications and specifically with communications in the media, um, you know, what is the media's... Um, contribution to creating this kind of salience. So in, in my, my master's studies, I started looking at um, like print newspapers where they were talking about uh, rape cases. What were they saying about rape cases? Uh, were they giving information? Were they really trying to um, make it front page kind of news stories, which obviously it isn't um, because being an LGBTIQ member is especially in, in the African context, is still something that is um, not really spoken about. It's, it's treated as something quite shameful. So um, obviously the results uh, that the research there yielded was that, you know, the media doesn't create any salience for it. Um, the thing that the media does do, however, it's very vocal about its um, resistance to patriarchy, to to toxic mas masculinity, to gender-based violence. Um, it puts that to the forefront. Um, children gets, the, gets the, the brunt of their attention, as it should. Um, and the mere fact that that's even a thing is, is horrid in itself. Um, but then when you start thinking about, you know, lesbian rapes, and, and we've now found in, in um, a lot of other countries um, that, that male children that show feminine or feminist kind of, or feminine kind of traits, um, that, that the family also gets together and, and um, you know, pay for, for, for a prostitute, um, you know, to, to make them straight. Um, and we've even heard cases, for example, where a mother um, would, would take her effeminate son and say, well, you know what, uh, we're going to make you straight. It's my obligation. Um, and a, a funny story, when I wrote this paper and I presented it at a conference, there was a panel of, of about 50 or 60 people, um, scholars from, from over Southern Africa. And while I was doing my presentation, I could see that there was this, this one professor from, from one of the, the, the African countries. Um, and when, when I was done, you know, you sit down by the panel and everybody can sort of ask you questions. And uh, he stood up and he said, but you know, you're talking about corrective rape 
and corrective rape is where um, people from the community or men from the community take women that are either lesbian or um, you know a little bit more butch or whatever the case might be, and they, they rape them to cure them of of lesbianism. You know, and he said, "Am I getting this right?" And I said, "Yes, that's the that's the definition." And he said, "Well, isn't the community then just aren't they doing?" a good thing like aren't they contributing to the community yeah and a lot of people have exactly that same reaction in fact three women stood up and they just walked out um you can just imagine uh you know a lot of them were feminist scholars and and you know so i considered i considered his response and i said to him well thank you very much for being brave enough to have that kind of opinion in the 21st century um you know, it would be would be funny if it wasn't so okay. Um, I said, but that is specifically what, what the issue is. You know, the issue isn't the, the rape in itself. The rape in itself is a crime and it's awful and it's evil. But the problem is the way that, that men think or that people think about LGBTIQ issues. Um, you know, if you are of the belief, and that is something from Al Gore that I that I always quote, you know, it's not the things that we don't know that gets us into trouble. It's the things that we know for an absolute fact that just isn't so. So if you believe that heteronormativity is the way that is natural, it's good, um, you know, then curative and corrective rape for you would be a community service. And I said, that's the mentality that we need to change. That's the conversations that we need to have. Um, you know, and that's where the mind shift needs to happen. Um, and that then led me to what my what my my PhD was about. And that was the next step. And that's how how poor people are being targeted for um, for not only corrective rape, but they very often get killed as well. Um, in America, there's a very a popular case study of Matthew Shepard um, that, that was tortured and killed for being gay. I think um, I told you I met his parents. Did I tell you that? No, you didn't. No, you didn't. I didn't you tell you? No. Yeah, they, um, so a good friend of mine, Ian Carlos Crawford, who I'm not sure if you met him in person here. Um, he's since relocated to New Jersey, but he was working with the Matthew Shepard Foundation um, doing some freelance work for them, um, and Tyler Clementi's parents uh, or mother, who also he was committed suicide based on cyberbullying, and which is for being of the LGBTQ community. Um, but they did a fundraiser at Stonewall for the Matthew Shepard Foundation. We had some performances and we had, they're located, I believe this was a couple of years ago, but their office at that time was in Denver, Colorado. And I was there, you know, I was helping produce the event and I met both of his parents and they're, they're just gorgeous, gorgeous people still fighting for this, for this injustice. Um, so yeah, so I, sorry, I didn't mention that to you before, but yeah, I got to meet his parents and they're still fighting for, for justice. Wow, that's that's so amazing. That's so amazing. You know, you mentioned something very interesting there. Um, you know, statistically, 37% higher suicide rates under LGBTIQ youths than than the heterosexual counterparts. You know, it's just because we have we have a context and that I don't think that condones it, but that allows for um depression in our community um it allows for curative and corrective rape to happen um it allows for femicide it allows for queer side um so it's so important to be invisible it's so important to always um you know have that as a as a as a conversational piece i mean and and people become more comfortable um the more you 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 broach the, the very difficult topics. And after a while, it's not a difficult topic, just like you always love quotes. Um, and that's the things that I that I really like is you always say it's all love. 
you know, it, and it's all empathy. And that's really what it is. It's when, when, you, when you're part of the, the human community, um, and, and that's why we, you know, we admire uh, art transformative kind of leaders like um, Desmond Tutu, it's one of my favorite South African, um, Nelson Mandela, you know, um, those, those kind of people, they, they look past the, the, the shells that encapsulate who they are. You know, they're more than a man, they're more than, um, you know, a black person, um, they're more than a, than a queer person, they're more than a woman, they're more than a whatever. They're just part of the human community. Um, and it's our responsibility. I, for example, always believe that, um, you know, you cannot expect a, a straight person to really understand what it is like to be a, a queer community member. But that doesn't mean that they're, um, they're not able to, to be educated and to be part of the conversation and to be part of the transformation that happens. Um, you know, a lovely thing really occurs between two people when they share their experiences, when they share, um, you know, their hardships. And this beautiful empathy grows between the two of them. And it makes you a better person for going through that experience. You know, and that's why why I was so, so grateful, even though it was um, very difficult and I didn't want to initially do it. I didn't want to do a, a PhD thesis on queer side. I was done with corrective rape. I read so many articles about the most disgusting thing that men do to women. And, you know, in some parts of the world, women do to men as well, but to the queer community um, that I was just done and dusted. That's not something that I wanted to do. Um, and then fate sort of intervened and I ended up doing a, a, a thesis about queer side. And I'm so grateful because um, the work that comes from, from the research uh, that I'm doing at the moment, um, hopefully in some way, um, will, will benefit or create some significance to the salience that there needs to be in the conversation of, of um, LGBTIQ people. Which is just incredible, incredible work. And I, I can't wait just to go through the journey with you. I mean, we have many, many, many more years together as family and I love having a firsthand look. But before we bring back Stefan, because I do want to bring back Stefan and ask you a few questions about the event you did in Cape Town. Tell us just quickly a top, top line about a student of yours that really made you proud, that went out took your word and did the work, did, did some sort of something special with that education that you helped them get. I know <laughs> well, but see if you can come up with like one top student. Um, well, there's a few actually watching, so I don't want to single out anybody. No, um, you can, you can get even all of them. What, what are yeah, some of the all students all of them are did? wonderful and I love all of them. Um, put your work uh, to, put your work to uh, like you said, it's about you. You know, you learn, but then you take an, ex an extra step to execute what you've learned. Yeah, um, which I think is it's important to listen. Like you said, have the empathy. If you're not in the situation, at least put yourself in the situation long enough to take a step to do something about it. Yeah, well, there there are some some phenomenal students doing phenomenal things. Um, we have a postgraduate program. Um, that that I'm very very proud of um, to be a part of, um, and we we divide it into pod members. Um, when you do research, you always try and um, pick your your supervisor. You know, someone that sort of aligns with your with your interest, your field of interest. And as I said, with communications, you know, there's gender and there's politics and there's religion and there's environment and there's um, health and there's organizations and all those different kinds of things. Mine obviously is gender um, and I'm very passionate about gender as well and you know I, I always screen students and I, I always you know they come up with really like the most phenomenal ideas and things that I would never in my life even think about um, and the strange thing that I'm finding is a lot of the students in, in gender studies um, even though they're not part of the LGBTIQI um, or the LGBTIQ community, 
they very interested in transformative kind of research, um, in research that would really make an impact in those areas of, of feminist discourse, you know, so in, in line of Michelle Foucault's, um, the Judith Butler's, um, you know, those kind of, of um, academics. And um, they're doing some feminist resistance theory is the one that just comes to mind, thanks, Megan. Um, uh, they are representation of women and women's health in, in print media and how, for example, like Alicia Keys, for example, what she's doing now is, um, you know, she's, she's appearing on, on cover pages of glossy magazines um, as natural as she, you know, as she can be. And, um, you know, so we did a study on that, for example. We're doing studies on um, anti-heroin, how that's becoming a trend in, in pop culture at the moment. If you're thinking about things like Orange is the New Black, if you think about, um, you know, women can, can kick but just as, as well as the men can. Um, so the, the avenue that I really see us going forward and moving into is there are four different stages of, of feminist discourse. So there are your first wave up until about your fourth wave feminism. Fourth wave feminism is, you know, you kind of like blow up the, the institution because it's, it's male dominated and it's too toxic and, you know, just burn the whole thing down to the ground and then start from the bottom back up. Right. But I think the, the next kind of wave of feminism would be that why do women want to be anti-heroines? Uh, it's, it's not necessarily a feminist trait of, uh, you know, if you think about cultures that are very feminine, um, English cultures, for example, are more feminist uh, or feminine. Um, a lot of African cultures are very feminine. Um, and they exhibit things like um, diplomacy, um, nurturing, you know, those kinds of qualities. So, you know, we are in that avenue where we're like female equality and female, you know, women can be as badass as men can. Um, but I, I see the next discourse being um, an elevation of women qualities being equal to male qualities so you know to, to push men to exhibit their feelings you know to um, not suppress those feelings to be more diplomatic um, than competitive or combative you know that sort of thing so yeah that's the kind of research that we're doing at the moment that's exciting so let's is stefan still in the room yes stefan is hello mr stefan. Stefan. And there is the happy couple. <laughs> no, that's not Sam. That's where's Sam? Sam, <laughs> um, we invited him to to the party, but he's he's above he's it. Enough. He's above it. He's a cat. He's a cat. So he's I'm above it. I know. <laughs> when I know. it's over, and in, in, it's time for feeding. So we. So I want to thank you both. So as as you can see, there's two of them, and they are a couple. For those of you that didn't know this, reveal they're a couple. Um, I'll so come to the story. I have two final questions before we close, and we've already got an hour, and I could probably go like two more, but let's take about ten more minutes. And I want to know before I ask the final question. Marshawn and Stefan, you have been together for how many years? 15. Yeah. Yeah. 15 years. And how do you support one another? I know supporting an artist is not always easy, but I also know firsthand experience from your sister included, supporting a scholar can also be challenging too. Give yeah. us tips and, and some tricks on how you how you both support each other. Especially being, you know, obviously in the LGBT community, um, just give us some quick top line uh, things that you guys do to support one another. Well, I, I think respect is very important. Um, I, even though I don't always understand where Stefan comes from, 
um, because our brains work differently. We're wired differently. Um, I, I do respect Stefan. He is one of the most intelligent, um, kind-hearted people that I know. Um, he'll literally um, give the shirt off his back. Um, you know, while we're walking outside, um, it bothers him immensely if there's someone walking on the street with us. Um, you know, so he's got a very generous heart, and I think I benefit from it as well. And and for that, I'm I'm always thankful and and I always respect his opinion. Um, he makes me think about things, I think, in a more different kind of way, because I think with, with Leonie as well, you might have found um, you being the, the creative one, we're very linear in the way that we think. So right is right and wrongs are wrongs. And for us, it's more about the technical way of, of going about things. So it's less clutter, getting things clean and clear. <laughs> You know, that's kind of like how our brains work. <laughs> and Stefan is messy. I'm not messy. You're messy then. I'm, <laughs> messy. I'm messy where I, where I work. But yeah. you know, in other areas, I'm very precise. and. Same here. Same, same. same. Yeah. <laughs> so but it, he supports me in so many ways because I'm sure he couldn't always see a future for me as an artist, you know, especially for the shitty uh, economy that we have in South Africa. Luckily, I, I do have clients overseas and so forth, which, and wonderful clients in South Africa. But um, he supports me in so many different ways by just letting me do my thing, you know. He's not on my case all the time. And That's a beautiful tip and trick. Do your yeah. thing. I think that's yeah, funny. and I think I support him actually by challenging him. You know, because I was very involved with with all these studies. So um, I'm I would ask him questions. I'm not sure if they're frozen. It could be the internet. Well, this is Stefan and Marchant, all the way from Durban, South Africa. They have been amazing, amazing guests. Um, I just appreciate them so much. And also, all of you from South Africa that are watching, we tried to do a little bit earlier tonight so you would be able to, to watch and also um, not be up too late. I know Ina's been setting her alarm, and thank you so much, Ina, for doing that. We appreciate it so, so much. Um, so next week, we are taking a little bit of a hiatus, just one week. Leonie and I are going to have a little weekend away before we go on, before she starts school. And then we'll be back the weekend after with a brand new guest. And I absolutely cannot, cannot wait. We have so, oh, September is just packed full of amazing, amazing, amazing people. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming today. We, I so appreciate it. And we're going to carry on. We are going to be doing this every single week. Next week, we are off. And then just stay tuned every Saturday. Usually, it's going to be at 8 p.m. That's going to be my regular time. And then if I do something overseas for some of my overseas talent, which includes um, the UK, as well as I hope Betty Bangles joins me in September or October for an episode again from South Africa. But thank you so much for your support. And thank you again, John Bronston, for my amazing theme song. I love it so very much. I love, love, love. So we're going to close with my theme song. Thank you so much, all of my friends and family and people I know really well and people I don't for tuning in and listening to some new points of view. I really appreciate it. All right. Have a great night, everybody. For you, it's a new point of view. To chew over what's new to you. Shoot the breeze, make buddies, and Melissa MCs, families, memories, original artists.